overcome by the blood of the Lamb, which is Jesus, and the word of our testimony. And we are just so excited because we love sharing stories and testimonies and stories of hope on Hope Today. And I'm so glad because it's Friday. Tom, Ann, and I, we're all back together again. And Tom, we have an incredible guest that's coming Oh, out. we really do. You, you're going to love Dan Schaefer. Uh, he has a, a book called I Don't Regret a Mile. We're going to ask him about that title. But we're also going to find out he is a, a chaplain to first responders, police officers, to firefighters to uh, all types of first responders. And he's also at 9-11. And we're going to ask him about his life story, but also to just let us know how can we be resilient in, in difficult times. And mm -hmm. that, that's so important today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to hear what he has to say because, you know, you mentioned how he was at 9-11 where mm -hmm. people experienced incredible sudden crisis where everything fell apart. And I'm just thinking like, I wonder if you at home have had your own personal 9-11 where your life exploded and, and the foundation of your life fell out from under you. We have to know how to be resilient. So I think he's going to have a lot of good wisdom for us. You know, Anna, just as you're talking about that point about people having their personal tragedies and things just happening and just that word resiliency is so powerful. I just think about, I heard um, Israel Houghton, he's a gospel artist and was just saying that, you know, people are having their personal tragedies, personal 9-11s every day. And I think it's so important that as we hear what others have gone through, hear the pain and sort of the things that they've walked through, that it gives us the courage to believe, you know, if God did it for them, mm -hmm. that he's going to do it for me too. And so if that's you today, we know there's a lot going on. Maybe you're dealing with a personal challenge. Maybe you're dealing with something mentally, emotionally, in your family. We are always here for you 24-7. So you can give us a call or prayer line because we have wonderful prayer partners that are standing by that would love to talk to you, to encourage you, because we want to see you move through and just know that Jesus is walking with you mm -hmm. as well. You know, I, I think about how we can all use our gifts. In fact, we're going to, we have a verse along those lines, but about how we can do that mm -hmm. when people are going through tragedy. So let's go to the mm -hmm. verse. First Peter 4, 10 and 11 says this, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever, amen. And I think about that, what a, what a, a responsibility, but a privilege to speak the words, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we speak, speak the words of God, yeah. as you are speaking the words of God. And you know what, that can be preaching, but it also can be encouragement for someone who's going through a difficult time. Right, absolutely. I love that you pull that out because God gave us these gifts so that we can be effective in this earth to be his salt, to be his light, to be difference makers. And I know for myself, I mean, I've just seen how God has given me a, a gift of encouragement, a gift of being able to walk alongside someone and be able to listen to their stories and just kind of, it's like that, that shepherding, or I think sometimes it's called like a pastoring, just coming alongside and speaking God's word, God's truths, but just loving well. And it's just such an honor to be used by God. Yeah, I think it's so important for us to just be used by God. And just as, you know, Tom, as you were hitting about the words, so speaking the very words of God, what does that mean? And I think a lot of times as Christians, I think it's not beating someone over the head with the Bible, but right. it's being intentional about even in those moments, listening to the Holy Spirit to be like, okay, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to speak? Even if you're at the grocery store, you're out somewhere. I just think there's all these moments where people are needing encouragement. People are very weary and burdensome and that we are ambassadors of Christ. We are the kingdom. We are the ecclesia. So we have the authority. We have the power to connect with our heavenly father, to get that download, to hear what he's saying and to speak life into someone. You know, life and death is in the power of the tongue. So let us speak life. Let us encourage one another. Let us love on people. Let us put our arm around someone. And that means we have to be uncomfortable. We have to kind of put our agenda, our to-do list on the side in order to move out and to usher in the love, the power and the healing and the grace of God. Tom. I love what it says here. This, this particular translation says, as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. So what are those forms? What are those forms that, uh, that you are uniquely gifted to be able to bless someone else with? Uh, you know, you think about it, ask the Lord. Uh, guys, uh, I think that sometimes we get, we get stuck in saying it has to be this way. This is the way we bless someone. We pray at the altar. We, we uh, you know, uh, preach the word of God. Those are all super, really good things. Mm -hmm. But there's some unique thing that God's gifted you 
to bring his grace to someone in a way that's just, no one else can do it, only you can do it. And it's so important that when we, when we realize that, Anna, mm -hmm. we, can, we can do amazing things that we never thought of. Yeah, and I, I think it's so important that we not compare ourselves to somebody else and like, oh, I wish I had this gift. Like, you know, Cindy, whenever you just like pray, it was so much power and you just get like, and you, we can really admire other people's gifts, but it's so important. It's okay to admire, but let's let God use us and develop our gifts to make an impact the way he's called us to. Yeah, yeah that's so good. Well, we're gonna take a short break and we'll be back with Dan Schaefer to share about how God used him to bring the grace of God in difficult situations. We'll be right back. Are you curious about end times? Do you have pressing questions about biblical prophecies? Grow in knowledge and face the future with confidence. The Prophecy Pro's Illustrated Guide to Tough Questions About the End Times can be yours with your best gift to Cornerstone Television. This accessible end time prophecy handbook delivers to the point answers about the rapture, the second coming, God's plan for Israel, the tribulation, and life in heaven. Call 888-665 4483 or go to ctvn.org donate. From blessings to hardships and triumphs to tragedies, our next guest has experienced them all. Dan Schaefer is the founder and president of Crisis Intervention International and he joins us now to share his incredible testimony of how God is using him to touch the lives of many. Dan, it's great to have you on Hope today. Great to be here, man. So I have to ask you about the name of the book. I don't regret a mile. What's that? What's that? The story of that title? Uh, there's an old uh, song, the Happy Goodman family sang it. So, uh, some of your gospel music people will probably remember them. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we, when we started our ministry, we had no idea where the Lord was going to take us. And he, he brought us through some great times and some deep valleys. Mm -hmm. And as we think back about the years that we've been in the ministry, when we thought about the book, we thought about all the miles behind us and we don't regret any of them. Uh, even the hard times, even the rough miles uh, led, to, uh, led to better life and better grounds. We can't go through life without going through the ups and the downs and, and that's what ministry is. We never had an, any idea what ministry was like until we started dealing with, uh, with, the, with people. people. It takes God's gift to deal with people. Yeah, yeah, people can mess up your ministry like anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let me, let, me, let me ask you though, your story. Um, you, uh, you know, obviously have served the Lord for a long time, but tell us how you came to know the Lord. I was, uh, I was in the Air Force. I was stationed at uh, McGuire Air Force Base, which isn't far from um, the Seaside Heights, the ocean. And we used to get down there on weekends um, and, you know, play on the beach. And one day uh, we were on the beach and we saw a couple, a couple of girls started talking to them. And uh, Ruth Ann, I met Ruth Ann for the first time on the beach. Mm -hmm. People say, where did you meet? We met on the beach, we met on the sand. And uh, we eventually had a date while uh, I was still at the base coming back and forth. And she told me her dad was a preacher. He was Assembly of God preacher. I said, oh, that's great. You know, I wasn't that familiar with Assemblies of God. I was raised uh, Methodist and Baptist. So she invited me to come up to, uh, to visit up at, the ho up at their home up in Wyckoff. I went up and visited and uh, ended up going to church, going to church. And uh, it was a church way out in the boonies in uh, Dover, uh, Dover, New Jersey. And uh, I remember sitting in, uh, you know, I remember sitting in church that night and, and an appeal was given to accept Jesus Christ in your, in your heart and in your life. And even though I was raised a good, solid religious background, it was, it was never that that call mm -hmm. and uh, I responded and I'll tell you I, I, I probably cried for an hour wow. I, 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 I had no idea how much was in me that needed to be out, taken out of me mm. and it was only uh, Jesus that night Jesus that night 
and things happened so fast. That was in September. And uh, I, I came um, uh, I, I came home in, uh, let's see, September, November, and I was asked by a local pastor uh, in New Ken if I'd like to preach. And I, and I said to myself, I've been saved three months. So Pastor Tom Basio in, uh, in New Ken uh, asked me to preach, and that started it off. Mm -hmm. And then I said, Lord, how do, how do I equip myself for the ministry? How do I equip myself to, to do this calling? I had a calling, but I had, but I had no plan. I had no goals. So I, I put in for, uh, uh, I applied to different Bible colleges, applied for different Bible colleges. And uh, some of them turned me down, uh, but uh, one did accept me. And uh, I went there, spent four years. It's now uh, University of Valley Forge. Spent my time there. And that was the beginning of our, beginning of our ministry. That's, that's how we got started. Mm. Yes. Wow. Now you share some incredible stories in your book about being on the scene of crisis, to have to come alongside someone and let them know that a loved one's just been killed in an accident or um, the opportunity to be at 9-11 on the scenes right there in the midst of that suffering. Can you share how God has used you in the midst of suffering? We sing a song that says, uh, I, it's never been this bad before. And uh, it's, it's hard to comprehend if you've never been there, if you've never been a police officer or a firefighter in the EMT, you have no idea the emotional uh, impact that it leaves on an individual. We, we have baggage that'll go with us to the grave. And the key to dealing with that we call it ventilate and validate. Cops, firefighters, EMS, military people, they don't, they don't talk about what they see. You, you can't go home and talk to your spouse or, or your loved ones and tell them about what you just saw or went through. I know through the many years, uh, the decades with Ruth Ann and I, I would be called sometimes in the middle of the night and uh, she'd help me get dressed because I, I, what department called me, what department called me? And I remember coming home after a fatal accident or a suicide or some horrible tragedy. And she would ask me, she says, how was it? And I would say, they're gonna be okay. Mm. But if I didn't say anything, uh, she knew that I didn't wanna talk. Mm -hmm. I didn't wanna talk. So I discovered through what I was going through, we need to have an outlet and an inlet for people of commonality. They have common experiences to be able to sit down and ventilate and validate. And that's how Crisis Intervention International came about. And we do like 32 different types of seminars. And uh, it, it's to help people to cope. How do you, how do you do, who can you talk to? And again, I couldn't talk to Ruth Ann. I, I, I couldn't talk to her. She, she would have had no idea. And it would have just traumatized her. And not having the training, what would she do with that information that I, that I give her? So, uh, like I said, we, we formed crisis intervention. We've, we've trained thousands of people uh, around the country in dealing with uh, crisis, critical incident stress management. Um, and and there's, there's, there's a new program out there ever since um, COVID hit. There's been a, a rise in a, a, a program called Resiliency. Okay. Resiliency, bouncing back. And I honestly don't know if we bounce back enough yet. Um, so I, our attorney general in the state of New Jersey formed a program called uh, the Police Resiliency Program. And uh, I, I went to the introduction of the uh, Police Resiliency uh, Seminar, and then they had a, a train-to-trainer for police resiliency. So I took the certification for the train-to-trainer to train officers to train their, in th their, their officers in their, in their agencies. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where we're at now. We're, we're, we're coming to the point where it, it, suicide is not an option. Suicide has never been as high as it's been mm -hmm. uh, with first responders mm -hmm. because the resources weren't there. The resources weren't there. We had floods a, a week ago, bad floods in Jersey. Uh, and we were called out to a, uh, a particular town to deal with first responders. And this was heartbreaking. You had first responders watching people holding onto trees, uh, people standing on top of their cars and they couldn't get to them. Yeah. Wow. They couldn't get to them. And they're standing there, they're, they're, they're first responders, they're there to help, they're here to save lives. 
And they told us they watched those people wash away. Mm. And then later on, they, they carried the body bags of the people that they watched that didn't survive. Mm. And, uh, you, you know, we're, we're not made to deal with issues like that. And that's why we have critical incident stress management. That's why we say, hey, we're, we're going to need a meeting. We've got to talk about this. And we get together and we ventilate and validate. When, when they ventilate, so what are the what are the main things they say? You mentioned resources and the, 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 they just at times can't help the people they want to help. But what are the kind of things that they, the, the, the biggest things that you hear over and over again? Well, we, uh, you know, as far as incidents, there's all kinds of situations and incidents that require an, an intervention, that intervention. Um, maybe you could clear that up a little bit more for me because it's well, such a... Well, I'm just, uh, as, you know, as you, they talk and share their stories with you about uh, in, yeah. in the class, what kind of things do they say they've struggled with, you know, or they've wrestled with? Well, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, of course, and uh, the dreams, mm -hmm. the nightmares, uh, the reoccurrence. Uh, and, you know, we have clinical psychologists. We, I run the Alpha team for the state of New Jersey. We have over 100 members. We have all first responders, and we have uh, two, clinic, two clinicians that work with us. And you, you don't have to be, you don't have to be, you don't have to have a degree to do this. Uh, people say, oh, I want to join the team, but I, I haven't had any certification or training. Well, we'll get you training. And it's amazing how it works. When we gather together for a debriefing or diffusing, we say very little. Uh, you'll start telling me your story, and I'll say, and then, mm. oh, okay, and then, and then. And they go through the story from the time the, the, the tones went off on the radio to call them to a fatal accident and uh, arriving at the accident, uh, cut, uh, cutting the, the bodies out of the car, dealing with uh, screaming people, crying people, dealing with neighbors, the whole thing. When, when, when they get back, what do they do with that? And that's why they call us and say, hey, we just had a bad call and we, we need to get together. Mm -hmm. And we get together, there's no judgment. It, it's just the key, ventilate, tell me more, right. tell me more. And it's like, uh, this is the term we use, emotionally vomit. Yeah. Wow. Emotionally vomit. Mm -hmm. Let it out. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I'd get sick and, oh, my mom, I'm sick, you know, I throw it. I said, well, get it all out, get it all out. And, and, and this is emotionally what we try to encourage people to do is mm. to get it out, talk about it. Because if you don't, it'll be in your dreams, it'll be in yeah. your thoughts. It'll and really uh, it'll make you sick. Yeah, it can make you sick. Yeah. And, and a lot of people quit their careers because they've, then they've never given that opportunity to mm -hmm. ventilate. And sometimes cops are the worst because... Cops don't want to show weakness. Mm -hmm. they, they don't want to show the fact that something is, is bothering them. When, but when someone in your department commits suicide, and I have, I have done 30, part of 38 police funerals, yeah. and 13 of them have been suicides. Wow. Suicides from people that I knew, people that sat in my church, but never had the opportunity to really come out, the, the pride, the ego, it, it buries that. And what happens, the longer you're in it, all of a sudden it all comes to a head. And now you've got all of these years that you should have been ventilating for all of those incidents that you went through. Mm -hmm. And now you're, you're sick. <clears throat> now you need a clinician. Now you need someone to help you. And that's, that's why we were called at 9-11. Uh, at, at I was on my way to a minister's uh, fellowship and Ruth Ann called me and, and told me a plane went into the towers. And I said, okay, that's not good. Then I got another call and I said, well, um, I, I, I need to go there. I need to go there. So I went to my police chief. I, I got a police car and, and went up to 9-11. Uh, to and when I got there, uh, Port Authority actually swore me in as a Port Authority uh, officer, my partner and I. So we were sworn in to meet. I still have my ID card, uh, Port Authority. Uh, police department so and we we spent I was there nine months yeah. uh, April 30th was my last day wow. and what what we did is we 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 did the the prayer over the bodies the yeah. body parts we did interventions uh, with little segments groups 
people hardly talk about it, but there's people that sat there for days on a curb, firefighters, EMS. They sat there for, never went home because they were yeah. waiting. They were waiting. Maybe they'll find something. Maybe, maybe, maybe there'll be a discovery. I, I remember seeing pictures of firefighters getting ready and saying, this is what we do. This is what we do. What we we're going to bring Sydney in, in again, uh, Dan, because we want, we want to just take this time to kind of transition into ministry because I know there are people out there. Mm -hmm. In fact, as you're speaking, I don't think we've ever done this on the show. I would like you to, to speak to mm -hmm. first responders that are in the audience that are mm -hmm. watching and they're viewing this program and they say, you know, I've never really dealt with all the issues and all the things I saw. Could you just speak right to that camera over there and speak to them and pray for them? Yes. Could you do that? My brothers and sisters, <clears throat> those of you that have been doing this for decades, those of you who've just started doing this, let's face it, there, there's, there's nothing in this world that's gonna affect you more in a negative way than what you experience doing your job. And I encourage you to reach out. There are critical incident teams around the country. I encourage you to reach out to them, to reach out to their families because their families are just as much affected as they are. And some of you soldiers, some of you guys and gals that can come back from Afghanistan and, and Iraq and those, you know what I'm talking about because they, they, they put you in that position. They did a debriefing with you and I encourage you, you know, take off that, get rid of that image, get rid of that image and get to the truth, get to the fact that you're not doing okay. People say, yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay. You can't be okay. If you're a human being, you can't be okay. So would you pray with me? And let me tell you something. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only thing that's helped me through this. I thank God for my brothers and sisters that stand with me and do the job, but it's only the, the power and the love of Jesus Christ that's helped me to overcome the many things that, that I have experienced in my life. So, and Jesus is the only way, you know, uh, you, can, you can go to a, a psychologist, a clinician, and they can help you deal with it, but Jesus will deliver you from it. Mm -hmm. He will deliver you from it. Let's pray. Father, I'm so honored to be part of uh, this team that invited me to come and share this great need, especially now, Lord, the, the world is not the same the stress level, the, the violence, the hatred, the indifference is not the same. And our, our, our first responders, our police officers, our cops, uh, the firefighters, everybody's dealing with those issues. And I pray right now, if you've come to that point in your life, you're saying, I, I'm going to quit. I'm finished. I can't do it anymore. Give Jesus a chance. Give him a chance to, to pull you out of that, that, that mire and that yes. muck that you've been going through for all these years. And say, Lord Jesus, forgive me forgive me for being a sinner, not just from all my sins, but for uh, being a sinner and come into my life and, and change my, my, my thoughts and change my opinion and give me the strength that I need to do the job that, 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 that I'm called to do. So you pray that right now and, we, and we'll give God the glory and the praise and honor in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Dan, I just so appreciate just the sincerity and just everything that you're sharing because I know first responders, I have people in my family that have dealt with those things yeah, okay. and just hearing about how, you know, this like the PTSD and I can't even imagine some of the images that you see yeah. and you experience and go to bed at night and just things that you're carrying and you're holding. What does Jesus do and in your experience when he stepped right in and as you were walking and processing, processing through it, what were some specific things that he told you or spoke to you to help you to get through? Let go. Let go. For years, I bottled it. For years, I stuffed it. I stacked it. And it got to the point where it broke me. It broke me. And I don't care how tough you are. I don't care how well you were trained to, to be and resilient, but everybody's got a soul. Everybody's got a heart. And uh, I found myself more broken even now than before because it's a heaviness that, that draws on our spirit. It, 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 saps, it saps the life out of us. And uh, as a pastor, uh, a preacher, a Christian, I'm glad the Lord's there when I need him. Um, I've gone to calls to notify a family their son, their 16 year old son was just killed on a, on a bicycle. 
And I can remember just driving along to go to that home and my whole body was shaking because I, I don't know, how do I do this again? And I remember pulling many times off to the side of the road and say, Lord Jesus, help me. Mm -hmm. This is the worst news this pair, these parents are ever gonna hear. And you have to help me to present myself as a, uh, as a, as a, a, a vessel that they can reach out to and, and reach out to. And uh, we, we need to get off our high horse of, uh, you know, I can, I'm okay. I, I can I can do it. Right. I can do it. Can't can't do it. If you're a human being, you can't do it. So my release, of course, is, is my is my wife, uh, who's there for me, but that I can uh, just pour my heart out to the Lord. Yeah, just sure. just right. let that brokenness go through a healing yeah. process. You know. Yeah. So. Dan, thank you so much for your service and thank for you. your example. And I love how you your example of how you ask God to help you know how to minister to that person because we can't do it in our own strength. No. We yeah. need Jesus to love others That's well. That's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. The book is called I Don't Regret a Mile, Daniel R. Schaefer. And uh, I agree with what Anna said. Thank you. Thank you for, I mean, you, you represent, you've got Brick Township, New Jersey, but you represent a whole lot. You have a list of them in here of all and the different. In the last four years, I've been with the Secret Service. So that's, oh my goodness. Uh, and so, right now, ICE is looking for help and, yeah. and they need it. So we have people, hopefully we can help in some of these other agencies. Yeah. Every agency, I imagine the, the more secretive, the harder it is in, oh, some, in many yeah. cases to deal with the PTSD and the trauma. Thank you again so much for praying for our viewers. And if, if you're out there and, and that's something that you know you need, reach out to Jesus today. Don't wait, don't hold back. Reach out to him today because he's reaching out for you. He surely is. And you know, this whole show, we just I love what Pastor Dan was just saying, to let go. You know, I know a lot of us are walking through some really hard things right now and traumatic situations and things with the pandemic and mental health crisis, the opioid addiction. I mean, there's so much that is going on. But you know what we have? We have Jesus. And just like Dan said, just today, if that's you and any of us, say, help, help me, Lord. Reach out to him. He will grab hold of you and he will wrap his arms around you. He will love you. He will touch you. He will heal you and he will pull you through. We love you and we're so glad that you joined us for this very special Hope Today. Have a good one.